Hello, this is Joseph Jensen again. Joseph Andrew Jensen Sr. is actually my full name. I'm an ordained minister of the Universal Life Ministry, uh, Church. I started my ministry, I was, became an ordained minister in June 9th, 19, uh, 2019. Now, I'm already starting to stutter, but please excuse me. I'm going to try to stay on point this time. And not go into too many trans, uh, you know, tangents. Uh, I explained a lot of things in my last video. This one, I, I told people it was going to be about Muhammad. Now, Muhammad, Muhammad married a woman named Khadija. She was a widow, and she had a daughter. Uh, She's 15 years older than Muhammad. Muhammad, when he found her, he fell in love with her. And they, they acted together. Khadija had three boys and three girls. He lived to be 40 years old, meaning his sons were around 20 years old. Um, before he had this um, vision. This vision was in the cave of Haran. Uh, hero. Anyway, in this cave where Muhammad went to to often pray, he ended up having a, a talk with Gabriel, the angel. And got, he was in that cave, I don't know how long he was in that cave, two or three days, or one day, hours, I don't know. He was in that cave, though. And uh, he learned there was but one God. He also learned a lot of, uh, a few other things, but he didn't, the main thing is that he learned where there was but one God. Now Mecca itself at that time was Islamic Islam. The Islamics believed in 360 gods, exactly 360. On the Kaaba, which I had a comp on the other computer that I described with uh, another thing about a lieutenant that found, a uh, Russian lieutenant uh, airman that found Noah's Ark. Um, it was on an ex old XP computer. Now, another thing that's on that computer is a picture of the old Kaaba. I think it was in 1960 when they ground off at the top border of the, on each side of the cabal, there was a depiction of 90 gods on each side, exactly 90. 90, 90, 90, and 90 add up to 360. That's a magical number. 360 and adds up, you know, that's the days of the year. There's four seasons, you know, it's, so nine, there's 90 days in one season, 90 days in another, 90 days in another, 90 days. Also, 90 degrees completes a, a circle. It also completes a square. It completes a rectangle. That's why three, the calendar of ancient times was always 360 because it was based on these 360 gods originally. 360 gods. There was the tribes of the Arab tribes. And each tribe had their own gods. That, and they, they, they had to place these gods on depictions on the top of the Kaaba. Because the, the Kaaba is a temple, but it's also a meeting place. It's a big mosque. It's a meeting place for all the tribes to come together and to meet. So all the gods were depicted on there. Like I said, it was about somewhere in 1960 when they ground it up and started putting in uh, the writings of the Quran. The Quran's another interesting story, and I'll get to that. Okay, just getting back to Muhammad. Muhammad, he was 40 years old when he had to talk to uh, Gabriel. Like his sons again, about twenty. He came back from that cave, 
And he, when he came back from that cave, he started basically preaching in Mecca, saying, there is but one God. I just got with the angel Gabriel. And he said, there's but one God. Well, the Muslims weren't ready for that. The, not Muslims, the Islamics weren't ready for that. Pardon me, don't ever get that confused about the Muslims and the Islamics. Because there's two different things, and I'll explain that big time. The Islam wasn't ready for one God. They had 360 gods. They had statues of them. They had, you know, all kinds of things for them. And they sacrificed the 360 gods. So when Muslim, when uh, Muhammad opened up his mouth to tell people there was 360, uh, there wasn't but three, uh, 360 gods. There was only but one God, Allah. And besides, Allah is the name for God. There's but one God, one Allah. They pretty much beat him, beat, beat him, kicked him, punched him, you know, everything but killed him. His sons, like I said, they've been about 20 years old, came to his rescue. When they came to his rescue, they were killed and beheaded in front of Muhammad immediately. Now, Khadijah, Khadijah, Khadijah whatever, it's, it's, I call it Khadija. Khadija was a, like I said, his wife. She was broken hearted at that fact. Her sons just died. She, they also had three daughters. Three daughters besides the one daughter that when he married Khadija, was Khadija. Okay, when they married Khadija, like I said, there were six children besides the one, but the one, you know, didn't ever be there because she didn't associate herself with her father because her father wasn't that popular. You know, he stayed pretty much away. At this point, even Khadija stayed pretty much away from Muhammad because she, she just lost three sons because of him. And they were pretty much... You know, you don't rock the boat. Keep your mouth shut. So Muhammad didn't really get to go preaching. But when he did preach, they took one of the daughters, if not all the daughters, the three daughters that they had, and they raped them. But they definitely took one daughter each time and married her to an Islamic leader. This is known as a Shiite. Now, I mentioned the other thing. What, what they got? What do they have to be proud of? Their direct bloodlines, because they raped and kidnapped a daughter. In fact, every time Muhammad opened up his mouth, another daughter was taken. Until all three daughters were taken. So Muhammad might have tried to be a preacher, but he was never a preacher. He never got up inside any um, mosque and shouted out. Things he couldn't say nothing. Well, when Khadijah was 49 years old, this is the part that gets hard for me because it's really it get, hits me because it hits God. I can almost feel God crying right now. You know, he's he's waited a long time for this message to get out. Nobody's told this story, and I guess it's, I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because no everybody's scared to tell this story. Or doesn't want to think about this story because it's too risky. But what I'm trying to tell you, when Khadija died, Muhammad went crazy. He went berserk. He started turning over those statues. He, he had a revolution. He was turning over the statues. Well, the Meccans had watched Muhammad trying to be a preacher so many times. Loosen his daughters. Loosen his sons. The Meccans... They started helping him, turning over the statues, turning over, tearing down paintings, pictures, all kinds of things. You know, they were just joined in the revolution. 157 followers, Meccans, not really followers because they, they, they but three, five, 157 Meccans helped him escape. 
The others were persecuted. Every, every, everybody was persecuted until they got down to the numbers of people that weren't sympathizers with Muhammad. In fact, they set out a, a, a bounty on Ma, uh, Muhammad in those 157. They said, you know, off with their heads, but bring us back Muhammad. Bring us back Muhammad, but, you, but everybody else dies. They made it to Ethiopia. They couldn't stay in Ar 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 Arabia anymore. They couldn't stay in Saudi Arabia. They had to get out of Saudi Arabia altogether. And the Ethiopians gave them refuge. They gave them refuge. And they stayed there one year. And the Ethiopians were Christians. I'll get to that afterwards so I don't get into tangents here. The Ethiopians were Christians. And they told Muhammad all the stories of Jesus Christ. All the stories of Jesus Christ. Now I'm saying that, emphasizing that for a reason. All the stories of Jesus Christ. And they, had, they were telling these things to Muhammad for a year and his followers. But his followers, there's one thing that came about about a year later was they started, you know, not exactly a year later, but just before a year was there, they started telling a person, Jesus said, a man was to have but one wife and cleave to her to become one flesh. Oh no, that didn't settle right with those 157 followers, even though they helped Muhammad escape. They weren't ready to, to give up their multiple wives and the way they, they, they're past. They're the way they lived. And they tried to convince the Ethiopians to do the same. They said, no, it was always meant for Allah, God, said to multiply the world. That was the important thing, multiply. And they tried to convince the Ethiopians that it was a just thing to have more than one wife, or a woman, for that matter, and just to have children. Well, that was it for the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians said, you went to Muhammad and told him, he says, you can stay because you never had more than one wife and you never went along with what they, they were saying. So you can stay, but they got to go. And they exiled the Ethiopians and they didn't give them refuge anymore, those 158, seven people. But Muhammad stayed another year and he learned Christianity up and down. He learned the truth. Now I will talk about Christianity with the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians just happened to be, they were Jews, the Ethiopians. They first were the ancestors of Cush. Cush was a, did not go along. He wouldn't take the throne from the Tower of Babel. Ham was the first um, king in, in there, and he would refuse the throne to have anything to do with the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> he was a black man, and he went to Ethiopia, uh, and he was stayed in Ethiopia. He was a pretty, um, how do you say, trustworthy fella. He made with one of his daughters, Sheba, the queen of one part of Ethiopia called Sheba. There again, you know the story. She married Solomon. It's one of his favorite wives. When Nebuchadnezzar ever conquered Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar allowed the Jews to build back Solomon's temple after they burned it down. But do you know it was empty when they found it? Why was it empty? Because everything was taken out of Solomon's temple. We're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're talking about the scrolls. We're talking about anything, uh, anything important or of value was taken, that was of value spiritually, was taken out of 
Solomon's temple and, and taken to Ethiopia under the care of Sheba. The word said today, they'll admit to it right now. Um, it was um, Josh Gates that's on TV that actually has an interview with the Holy of Holies. And he asked if he can go in and they said, no, you can't go in. But I will talk to you. And he talked a few minutes with uh, Josh Gates. So today we know, and they'll tell us it's in there. It's obvious why they can't let nobody in. It's not because the ark's not in there, but whoever goes in there, it means instant death. It means instant death. There's, they just, uh, that's the way the Ethiopians know. Now, why do that? Besides this marriage, being Solomon's wife married, I mean, uh, Sheba married Solomon and was Jewish. They were also the three wise men that found Jesus in a manger. They found three Jesus in a manger and they followed Jesus from the manger to the cross. They didn't just give their grits of, of frankincense and gold and myrrh and then left. They're not these, but that's not the way the Ethiopians do it. The Ethiopians, they go, they followed him. The same as they were with Muhammad, and going back to Muhammad, Muhammad stayed there another year learning Christianity. He learned the stories of Christ. The Ethiopians were actually the first Christians because they, were, they found him in the manger and they followed him to the cross. They're the ones that know Jesus Christ better than anybody. Thomas in the Bible grew up with Jesus Christ. That's why he doubted so much. He says, man, I know you. I've known you since I was a kid. You know, it's like, I know you can't be God because you, you're, you, you was, I grew up with you. Okay, now here's the thing. The Ethiopians know all this and they, they followed him. They know his whole childhood. It's written down. You want to find out about Jesus Christ? Ask the Ethiopians what they know about Jesus Christ. It'll be a whole lot more than what's written in the Bible about Jesus Christ. And that's interesting to me. I don't know what they know. I haven't read what they know, but I know they know so much more than what's written in the Bible. Now, Muhammad stayed there another year, and then the Arabs came up, or the Islams come, come up, and they said, we know Muhammad's here. We found one of his followers well, let's go back, I'll go back in just a second. They didn't say that to him. They threw down the head of the follower in front of him. And they said, he told us Muhammad was here. Bring us Muhammad. The Ethiopians, they, they, they're not, you know, they're not uh, exactly, you know, intimidated by anybody. And so they said, uh, you might as well ask him again, because he might, he's, we don't know anything about Muhammad or who you're talking about. And they said, well, we know he, they, he was here. I says, no, how do you know? We don't know this guy, but how do you know he wasn't sending you the wrong way just to throw you off the track? He better ask him again. Well, they couldn't ask him. His head was cut off. So the Islamics left. But they said they'll be back if they find another follower. This time they wouldn't cut that guy's head off until they found, until everything was settled. And they'd come back with the army. They said they'd come back with the army. they find another follower. Muhammad, he had never killed anybody before. He never had, had an army. He had 157 followers that he was scared to death. Uh, when they, 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 they had to leave, that they get harmed. So he was already ready to leave, just like they were. But after that, this happened, he surely, he told me, he says, I got to go. I can't put you in danger. I won't have another person killed on account of me. I won't, there's no way I can stay here like this. 
Well, the Ethiopians gave him a horse. They gave him plenty of provisions. And they gave him everything. Muhammad would not allow anybody to go with him because he was scared for their lives. And he, they set out. But they, two Ethiopians and these guys kind of fit in. In other words, they, they weren't all, all black. They were more the fit-in type to, to the Arabic culture. And they followed him from a distance. You know, they didn't let anybody know. Even Muhammad didn't know they were following him. Muhammad ended up in Medina. Medina was only like 500 people. There was, there was probably less than 500 people. I'm only imagining there was up to 500 people, but this is, what God, this is God's story, not mine. God's telling the story, told the story to me, and I'm telling it to you. That was for like 500 people in there. And they stayed there. Muhammad stayed in a, ha in a place, a house, that was off the beaten track, pretty much for himself, and he didn't come out. The Ethiopians watched him. They watched him a month, stayed by himself, and he wasn't, they watched him two months, and he, he said, there you go. They know he didn't have enough food to, to go much longer. They said, man, we can't, we, we can't just sit here and watch. He's not coming out. He's not preaching. He's not doing anything. He's just in that house. So the Ethiopians finally approached him a couple months later, and they said, man, he's, he's lying on the floor sick. They had to get him back together. I mean, he's like, okay. They had to get him back together, feed him, give him water. You know, whatever. And he was li living there basically in, in his own waste. And they just like said, oh my God, you know, when they saw him. Well, it, you see, the thing about it was, Muhammad... He meant to actually die. I mean, he was just staying scared. He went there just so nobody would bother him. Well, he's, they kept feeding him and coming back for basically another year. Now, we're talking about the revolution or whatever you want to call it, the rebellion of Muhammad in them happened when Khadija was 49 years old. The year, if I'm not mistaken, it was like six, 630 AD, 630 AD. They stayed away for six, so 632. Now, 3632 was an important date because that's when they found out again where Muhammad was. Somehow, rumors, whatever, there's, there's a guy living there, been living there for a long time, and he's never going out. And uh, we don't know, you know, he, we think he's the Muhammad. Just out of suspicion, a general with a thousand Islamic things, went to make Medina. And when they went to Medina, they planned to get Muhammad. They planned to get Muhammad and bring him back to recant Allah, to recant God. See, there is no God, just 360 like thing. I just made that up. You know, he just wanted that. And he, they wanted him to write that, to write a Quran. Well, Muhammad, when they captured Muhammad, the general took him and they, they, they took off. They got they until they were way out of sight, you know, maybe a day's journey. You know, they, they were gone. The, the general only took, you know, 30 men with him. It was nothing, nobody big, it was like 30 men. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm getting, there was like a thousand men went with the general. It was 10,000 that went. I got to start this thing over. I guess I explained myself. There was 1,000 that went with the general back to Mecca with Muhammad. 
But there was 10,000. You know how the, the Quran would say there was, Muhammad had 10,000? It wasn't Muhammad that had 10,000. It was Islam had 10,000 going to Medina to get Muhammad. The general returned to Mecca. He's like a day's journey out with 1,000 Meccans. My, my brain was floating off. I'm sorry. But you know, I'm, I'm pretty straight. Now, 1,000 Meccans and the general were headed back. They didn't know anything. But the other 9,000 that stayed back, they had genocide. They killed 500 men, women, and children. I mean, they just killed everybody. Then they went to build a mosque, a big mosque, a huge mosque. Because that was their story that they had to go by. They knew Muhammad was going to be taken back to recant and write the Quran. So the next thing is they had to carry their religion out. So they built a huge mosque and they had already had their version of what to do. Sing their prayers out from the mosque. Looked like it was Muhammad's home and he was a big preacher. They also said, you know, this is Muhammad. And he said he sent his 10,000 soldiers back to Mecca, written in their thing, to take back Mecca, uh, to take Mecca. You know, it's like, okay, the thing was all figured out. But the general, when he got to the Mecca, close to Mecca, he had a feeling. He had a feeling about something weird was happening. So he wasn't, he got uh, Muhammad, which was handcuffed, you know, tied to the horse. They had a saddle, kind of maybe, and they tied him his hands to the saddle. And he was on that horse. And the general took his cloak off and put it around Muhammad. He took the binds off his hands and untied him underneath the cloak. His soldiers didn't see him do it. And then they paraded Muhammad in front of them like it, it was saying like, okay, see Muhammad. You know, what would that gonna make them, they were going to make an example of Muhammad. You know, they thought the people would be stoning Muhammad. You know, because the Islamists were told that, you know. Instead, when they got close to the to the do doors of Mecca, the door started opening and said, praise be to Allah, it's Muhammad. The Meccans were saying, praise be to Muhammad, it's, it's Muhammad. 36,000 Meccans were in Mecca hollering, Praise be to God, it's Allah. Praise be to Allah, okay? Praise be to God. It's Muhammad. 1,000 soldiers is nothing to 3,000 Meccans. So the general kind of prayed him in first. He was kind of like, okay, feeling a little safe because now he's got him in front of him. He could look like, Okay, I'm behind Muhammad. I brought him back. You know, I brought your your prophet back. But the poor thing about it was, his soldiers, uh, Muhammad, started, he got it into the moment, and he started getting off his horse. He jumped off his horse to start hugging people and shaking hands. Well, at that moment, the Islamic soldiers, despite the numbers of Meccans, they got off their horses going to pull out their swords. They never got their swords out the sheath before the Meccans jumped all over those soldiers and cut off their heads with their own swords. Oh, well, then Muhammad had to grab the, the general. Muhammad grabbed the general, not on his horse. He got him off the horse and said, come on, we got to go. And they ran to the cabal into the Temple of Kabbalah. Well, the Islamic leader inside the Kabbalah, when he saw what was going on, he saw Muhammad, he says, praise be to Allah, you're all right, Muhammad. He was a turncoat right then. 
He had to go along with it. And he says, Oh, I'm glad you're so your your thing. Praise be to Allah. You know, Allah's Allah's to God, right? And two seconds before that happened, I mean, he was praying to 36, uh, 360 uh, gods. Okay. Now, he says, I've always been a believer in you and God, Allah. But I, you, can you blame these people for not understanding after after hundreds of years, thousands of years of believing in their gods? You got to explain this. So please write it down. Explain your beliefs, how you know this and what happened and everything in the Quran and let us so that we might know what happened. He was kind of, he, he knew what he was doing. He's trying to get him to write the Quran. But he also knew that they could take the book and all uh, kind of mix their own beliefs in there with the Kabbalah. That's what they did anyway. But, you know, Muhammad thought for a second. It wasn't stupid. He thought for a second. He said, okay, I'll do it. So, But, you know, what, so, the Islamic leader or whatever inside the Mecca, he let, he left him in a room, let him to write. What, what, um, Muhammad was actually writing was about Christianity. He told him about Jesus. He told him about Moses. He told him about that. That's why in the first Quran, it's filled with Jesus was the highest prophet. They couldn't say he was God because Allah's, there's only but one Allah, God. And they, they said, but he's the one of the major, major, major prophets. They celebrate everything about, about God, uh, Jesus Christ. They still do, but they're, they're not ready to tell, say anybody's God. They can't say that because they say, yes, he's a great, great prophet, but uh, the major prophet of all prophets, but he, he, they can't say he's God because there's only one, uh, one God. That's kind of understandable. Okay, now here's what I'm saying. They're confused. They are Christian now. These Muslims uh, read the Bible, read, read the Quran with the first Quran, had no real violence in it. You know, because Sharia law and stuff had, it was 12 years after, uh, more than 12 years, because actually, we're talking about it was the, the, the nut time now is 632 AD. They attacked Iraq in 635 AD. Muhammad died the same year in 632 AD. I think it was June the 10th. They said, you know, Muhammad died. So he could, but he wrote what he wrote between the small time that he was there, the short time. And when he was there, he wrote what he wrote was about Christianity, and that was in the first. Well, that's why they had they they've had like seven different uh, Qurans, but the one in Medina it mentions nothing about Jesus Christ. It mentions nothing. In fact, it puts Sharia law first. It puts the fact that they have the right to take any woman. A woman's guilty of rape. If, she, if, if a man takes a woman and entices him in any way, even if she wore covering from head to toe and all around, around her face and everything, but her eyes were exposed and she let him on with the eyes, that's where they're going to say she's guilty of rape. She let him on. This is, they were a sick culture. You know, they're, they're not only believers of 360 gods, they were believers in multiple, multiple not just not just wives, any girl. She was free game for Muslims, but not Muslims, Islams, and still are. You, you you understand the terrorists do that today, so it's it's not inconceivable.
They still do that today. Any woman is a threatened that wear does all those clothes and everything because that's the only thing that could possibly save her from being raped or being blamed for a rape. That she tried not to think, but she has to, when they walk outside, they got to walk with their brother, their father, um, some man in that household, has, it has to be a brother or, or the father, as an escort. This is a strict culture because they're so perverted of a religion. And they wear all those clothes because that was the only way to halfway try to protect themselves and the law is saying you can't go outside without your brother or your, you know, it could be an uncle too. It could be any male figure in the family has to be an escort with them on the streets. So these women, like, are very, I mean, they were, like, free game, okay? It's like, like being an animal. And they were beating these people. They beat women, like, uh, with uh, switches and things. They can slap them and say, you know, this is all part of their culture. That was the thing to do. They just, inconceivable what they can do in their culture. Now when Muhammad learned Christianity and it taught these people that, he says, no, it's not right to, to, to be like this. You harm one youngin, you know, I mean, the, what Jesus said, you know, you, you know, they, you, don't, you don't harm the children. So anyway, Muhammad, he died in 632. The people of Medina didn't know what was going on for a long time, so they tried to go back. I, like 6,000. It was almost the whole 9,000. It was like right at 9,000 went back to Mecca. But there were still 36,000 Meccans. You know, that were, there was nobody in Mecca that was Islamic at that time. I can tell you. They were all saying all that. So when those 9,000 went there, they weren't even, uh, you know, they couldn't get to Harley to the gates, and they were, they, you know, and they said, they, they, they knew they were in trouble. So they put up a white flag, and they went into, they went into Mecca under a white flag, the, 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 the army leaders. And when they went in there, they said, they found out what thing, and it says, they went back to Medina. They said, okay, we're going to leave here, we, you know, whatever. They were left to write the Quran. Right? You know, they actually went there with the pages of Muhammad, Christianity, whatever. I don't think so. No, they didn't go back with them. They didn't go back with Muhammad's papers. They went back. Without um, his Quran, no, I'm I'm kind of messing this up because I'm having God's talking to me at the same time I'm talking to you. He's correcting me, and he's telling me the truth. So I mean, I'm not going to remake this tape over. I'm going to tell you like this: uh, what God's telling me. No, he did go. They they did uh, to take the papers from Muhammad, what he had, and he took it back to Medina to read it hoping that they would change their minds and become Islamic. I mean, uh, become, oh, the biggest thing I missed, God's really not punching me in the head now. Uh, the biggest thing I missed was the fact that the Islamic leader and said, I cannot no, I says, I no, cannot ne no longer call myself an Islamic anywhere in this town. The Meccans want to be called Muslims. Muslims. Okay, you understand this, people. Muslims. Even the Islamic leader said, he says, I can't call myself Islamic unless they come kill me. I am a Muslim. Now he sent his army of Islamic soldiers back to Medina with his papers to kind of go over his paper, hoping that the Islamic soldiers would become Muslims. But instead, they went back there, 
the, there was like, and they told him, hey, start writing, start writing the Quran on our own. Write our own thing of my thing. We have to write our own thing. We're going to recruit an army. We have to recruit an army that's big enough to defeat Mecca. And surely these people aren't as strong as the soldiers, so they can defeat them with twice the army that they had already, which is 9,000. Okay? So they had 9,000. They wanted 18,000 to take on 36,000 civilians. So they thought it was going to be easy. And they set out on the crusades. And they, they barged into households, raped, killed the children. Thank God they killed the children because they raped the mothers and the daughters that were of age in front of the husband and the brothers. It, it, you know, the, the, in front of them. And then he told the, the, the husband and the brothers, you're going to either follow us or we're going to carry them with us. And we're going to do this all the time to them. Torture them all the time. They had no choice but to become Islamic soldiers. Or to, to watch their, 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 their wives and their daughters continually raped by multiple Islamics. Not just one. You know? They didn't have choices. They had to join them. That's the way they work. That's the way they work if they came to America today. Guess what do you don't understand? They can, we can all be, be defeated by them because that's, what, that's how they are. They can go into one single household and take it over for months. Uh, holding the hus husbands to watch what they can do and killing the children right away. And nobody would know what's going on. You know, it's, it's like these people created this way of, of, of fighting. You, you can't win on something like that. So what happens... Was they recruited eighteen thousand? Actually, they didn't get eighteen thousand. That's when God's created the thing. It was, uh, and I wrote it in my book. A, they only got about thirty-five hundred people, guys. Thirty-five hundred. That's until you know they had what sixteen thousand five hundred people. They were still pretty good short. Well, then in six thirty-five A.D. They decided to try to take on Iraq. Oh, man. Did they bite off more than they chew? I mean, Alexander the Great, Great had it already tried. Genghis Khan had already tried. All those Turkish kings and the Iranian kings had gone up against them. Nobody's ever defeated Iraq. And so here, they're gonna, they think they're going to barge in there and start cutting off heads. Now, the funny story, it's in my book. Everything I'm telling you is in the book. And it's actually, my, you know, my book can't get confused like I can and get off the, get on track and lose track of the story. But the, you see what I'm saying? That's why I'm, I'm trying to get the book in everybody's hands because the same thing's in the book more accurately. But the, the, here's, the, here's the thing I'm trying to tell you is that 635, they tried to take Iraq. They swing in swords and they cut off heads of a few Iraqis. The Iraqis stayed indoors. They went indoors, off the streets. I told you in the last thing that they had their own language, speak, able to speak their own language in, in, in secret. They just knew to stay off the street and stay quiet. And, uh, you know, but everybody's got to sleep sometime. That's just this cute story in my, in my book. You know, everybody's going to sleep sometime. And that's when the Iraqis would take off heads when somebody's sound asleep. You know, you ever heard the, the, the saying, you know, I hope you wake up with your head on straight or your head on, you know, with your head on in the morning? That started with them. They were good at it. It was like, oh man, that saying is, has been around a long time. It wasn't Islam that started learning how to take off heads, even though they had taken off the heads of their sons, you know, to make an example. That was the thing for the Iraqis, to do it in the middle of the night, and then they disappear. Kind of like, you know, ants go to the anthill. You don't know that how many is in, in there, or what's in, in the anthill until you try to crush it, and then you got a problem. 
So anyway, it, God, because Islam, I mean, Iraqis had so much to, to, to hidden and truth hidden, like they did with every other leader. They had, they could not. They they, they were told by Noah, God, or every Noah and God, don't speak the language in front of it and don't let them know what's under your feet. We're talking about the scrolls that were carried on the ark, the papers, the th you know, the art artifacts, the small artifacts that make a real big difference, not the Lion of Babylon and not the, 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 the palace rooms and stuff. We're talking about the things that really make them matter. Nobody else could read them, but if they destroy them, they destroy them. That's the history. You know, they, they, I told you, I tried to tell you in the last day, they have written down all the wives, all the children's names. The Jews only didn't do that. They only wrote down the names of the, <laughs> the people, certain people in the thing, like Methuselah, like Lam Lamech. Lamech was uh, the father of Noah, you know? They only wrote, you know, Methuselah was the father of Lamech. It's like, it's like they only wrote down, you know, Jared. They, these people were all just named in the Bible, but they didn't, they didn't write about nobody else. And we know that, you know, a dozen people didn't populate the, the, the earth to the point that they had to destroy the whole earth. Nor did, a, you know, a few people just build the Tower of Babel. It's common sense. So there's a lot of problems written in the Torah, and it was also re, 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 you know, taken in by the, in the Bible. You know, it's like, no, is anybody thinking about this? What's going on? You know, it's like, how can you read this thing and not have problems with it? So anyway, I'm getting off on the tangent. Muhammad, he died. I think it was June the 10th, it might have been June the 9th, whatever date, it was in June, in 635, 632 AD. 635 AD, they, caught, they went into Iraq, tried to recruit the Iraqis to help them so they could take over Mecca. They thought they could use them to take over Mecca. The Muslims in Mecca, not the Islam in Mecca. The Islam was out of Mecca. Now Islam was in Medina. Now, if you know anything about today, Medina is still the head terrorist place of all Islam. Every Islamic group, Al Qaeda, every 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 terrorist comes out of Medina, not Mecca. God bless every Muslim because they were the ones praying to Allah. They weren't praying to thirty-six gods. That mosque in Medina, that was never, never did Muhammad ever see it, did he ever preach from it, and the, the, the thing about it is, is he, Muhammad would never been associated with anybody that worshiped 36, 360 gods, or more than one god. So, this is a story of Muhammad that I needed to tell you, that God wanted to tell you. That's why he tried to cry in 2012 when all everybody was saying Muhammad it was, it was responsible for all those terrorist acts in Spain and Germany, France, Sweden, the United States. It's just like, he, he let me know. I, it, it, it was like, I didn't even ask God any questions about it. He just brought it up. I could feel him crying. Like I they feel him a while ago. And then he said he started straightening me out the way I'm thinking. That's why we God talks to me and lets me know. And that kind of lets you people know, too, that God's inside us. Not only God's inside us, our ancestors are inside us. My mother's inside of me. My father's inside of me. Because they're both dead. They're in my DNA. That's going to carry on to my, and my, my, my kids and my grandkids. And we're all going to be living 
in our DNA, which is heaven. We'll feel what everybody feels. We'll see what everybody sees. We'll hear what everybody hears. But again, if our DNA does not have hands, it doesn't have a mouth, it doesn't have feet. They can do nothing, but they do a lot. This world doesn't realize that every time we build something, create something, it's them telling us, they're constantly talk, talking to us. We get exhausted and finally fall asleep to a REM sleep that we can't, we can dream, but that was, until then, we, at, once we get past thinking about ourselves and our own problems, we're, our minds get on, you know, something inside of us is telling me what to do tomorrow. It's telling me what to, uh, what to do. And, and, and something, something is to always telling me to roll up and get out of bed, you know, or go to sleep. Anything, you know what I'm saying? They're constantly, we're doing, we're, we're fulfilling God's dream. We've been, anything that's built, you give, don't take credit for it. Give it credit to, you, to God and your ancestors. If you become anything or you've done anything in your life, it's not because you, you did it. It's because they got you to do it. They got you to use your hands. You don't have to believe in God. You don't have to believe in nothing. The fact is, if you're doing anything, if you're creating anything, you're building anything, you've done anything, you're learning anything, you did it with them telling you. So it's not really you have to worship anybody. The fact is, they are, they got control of us in the sense that everything we're doing, the point, but to refine it and to tell you that God's inside us. Now this has got to be told to the whole world because here's what happens. Once we realize that it's God and our ancestors telling us what to do, then we all have to start changing this world. We can't allow abortions. We got to speak up. We got to say stop. We got to take bullies. We got to take them, gangs. We either arm ourselves or disarm them, somehow. We have to. So it might, it might not be a bad idea, like in my book, where everybody learns, learns how to uh, use a weapon. Because it's gonna, it, it might get to the point where we have to start, start uh, defending ourselves or taking and ru running them out of town, so to speak. Not, not just, you don't want to, nobody wants to take anybody's life or torture anybody, okay? Because even the worst of the worst is going to have God inside of them. And they have a chance, potential to have children that are, that are innocent, they don't have a thing to do with them, but they're beautiful children and they will, they live on in DNA. You don't stop nobody's life. I don't care if it's justified in war. It's not right. We're going to have to learn down to, to lay down our... One thing I did like about Donald Trump, and I'll get it politically, is he did it in fight wars. He took us out of wars by cutting off money. We want to get rid of these people? Do, it, do, do, this, do what he did. Cut off the money. You cut off the money of drugs. You cut off the money. Of, you can, he cut off Al-Qaeda. He didn't know it wasn't because he just got all the men. He cut off Al Qaeda's money. Well, it wasn't Al Qaeda, but you know what I'm saying. He he got rid of, of their money. And the thing about it is, everybody's got to understand. Life is too precious. You can't just if you the Chinese are more than willing to destroy God. And destroy people. They take even people. You know anybody that doesn't go along. Gets thrown in jail. It's not as bad as you think. You think. I mean it's, some people will say. It's not as bad as you think. The heck it ain't. The people in China. They take, they take their kidneys. One of their kidneys. They take one of their lungs. They take one, anything they need from prisoners. 
political prisoners. They, they didn't have nothing but a, a difference in belief about the government. And they used them first. If they need an eye, they're going to take an eye. Whatever they need. Furthermore, every abortion that they do, they use them for body parts. You know, stem cells. These are savages. They not only destroy God, but they took the stem cells from persona, from the babies themselves, body parts from the babies themselves. These people are horrible. But they're not, they, but, and we're not talking about spiritually. We're just talking about their twisted human beings. And these leaders that have been doing this stuff, they need to be taken out. Not taken out and killed, but they need to be taken out of office, out of power. Destroy them, destroy them by taking away their power. Put them in the streets. I have a little cute story in my book about when I was in Dubai. Let's go, let's go to that because I've already finished pretty much about Muhammad. Unless God brings back anything else that say about Muhammad. But I was in Iraq for two years. I was in first time, first part of Iraq. I was down in a place called Al Kut. Al Kut was 30 miles from the Iranian border, with Al Kut being right in the middle, 15 miles. 15 miles from the base, 15 miles from the border of Iraq. al -Qut is on the Tigris River. It's right there. Actually, the base is on the Tigris River, so I'm wrong about that. So, But the Tigris River, you really couldn't even see it. I say, I, I mean, I, from the base side, only thing you could see was wheat reeds. You know, a, a, on the side of a river, reeds grow. But these reeds grew as tall as trees. I mean, these things are dry, up 35, 40, 50s, maybe up to 70 feet tall. These things are tall, huge. You can't see the river for the reeds. Muhammad, I mean, um, Iraq is old, fertile ground, very fertile ground. It's so thin, it's, if any of you know what snuff is, tobacco snuff in a can, that people used to dip. It's a, it's a consistency of baby powder, tan looking baby powder. If you sneeze, you could start a dust storm, literally. Start a dust storm. I mean, you think about sneezing into a, a powder puff can. You know what I'm saying? If you sneeze in it, you're gonna get it all over your face, you're gonna get it all over everything, your, your clothes and everything else. That's the way it is. You just, you gotta learn to sneeze into your, you, the, the cuff of your arm, or into a rag. That's the part of the reason why they wear so much things around their face. Uh, the clothes that they wear. You know, it's not, they've gotten used to the, the, that big heavy clothing on them. You know, even, even as though some of that clothing is only as thin as sheets, it's still, it, it's it's more than I, I got, uh, we put on, you know. And you don't see women there wearing bikinis. And I, I got to tell you that Iraq is old ground, but it's, you, if you spit in your hand, you know, something could grow in your hand. It's fertile ground. It still wants to grow things. Give it a little bit of water. Give it a little bit of moisture, and it comes back alive. You go out in the, in the Iraq, Iran, and you see, like, looks, looks like olive trees or something, willow trees. They're Winds blown over, I mean, it's just like sticks poking out the ground, roots, things, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not, it's a desert, but it's, it's not sand. It's soil. It's rich, fertile soil. That's how I first said, wow, this is not sand. It's not part of the ocean. I was a crane operator in Iraq. I was hired by KBR, Kellogg, Brown, and Root which was a help. We were there for the armed forces, all of them, the Marines, the Army especially, the NATO forces, you know, El Salvador, Georgia, Uganda, 
Everybody was there. George, you know, and we were there to help everybody. We put up buildings, and, and my job was putting up like what they call T walls, big concrete walls with the crane. Every base is surrounded with them. Every every living center, every quarters, anything like that is surrounded with them. They're all interlocking walls that have to be uh, put there because of mortar attacks. Uh, just everywhere. I put up thousands of these things. You know, every guy there that was there. Uh, any time at all could have put up a thousand things that was in a crane. We used our Iraqis to help us set these T-walls when I was in al Kut. At one time, when, the, 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 when there was a big fighting going on in, in al Kut, they couldn't come. They had to cross a bridge. They had to cross, cross the Tigris River to come to work. And they, 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 they be, a lot of them walk across, but there's is buses of them coming in that are from further away. But the ones from town, they just walk in, over across the bridge, and the bridge was, you know, they had to be to work at nine o'clock. So these they, they started migrating in, across that bridge into the thing. So maybe it started six o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, coming to coming to work. This seat's getting hard again. Anyway, the thing about it is, is. There was one time the fighting started really heavy. And I can tell you who was doing the majority of the fighting over there. The United States was doing its share. But the, these guys, the Georgians from Russia, the, the Russians from Georgia, holy cow. These guys were fat, sloppy guys that looked like they, you know, they, they had bellies bigger, as big as a sumo wrestler. They were... They, they, they either wouldn't, they couldn't tuck in their shirts in the uniform. Their uniforms are always wrinkled. But they get inside a Humvee with a machine gun on it. They would have to, when you're going out the base, with that, you go out at the, at the checkpoints. That's one thing. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process there. It's very dangerous when you leave a base. But when you're coming back, all the shells have to be emptied into drums at the checkpoints. And when the Georgians came back, they literally, inside the thing, could have machine gun shells stacked higher than them in the, in the, in the thing. I mean, they literally, when they opened the back door of that thing, they poured out of there like it was loaded at the top of machine gun shells. So they were doing some fighting, heavy ass top fighting. And when he did the, the, the heaviest fighting, it was like, um, these guys were like, it's no big thing. They, they just went out to do their job. They weren't talking about it. They weren't doing anything. Then uh, we go to the gym. I went to the gym a few times out there. And when you go to the gym, uh, well, first off in the mess hall, these guys would eat spaghetti. No sauce on it, no red sauce or nothing, just spaghetti with butter, huge amounts of butter on top of spaghetti and bread the same way. Loaves of bread, like four or five loaves a piece. They would just butter it up and eat nothing but carbs. And then they would go to the gym. Every one of them, there wasn't a Georgian there that didn't bend the bar, a steel bar was bent like the half moon was, you know, a wagon wheel with weights. These guys were, man, I, they, they could lift 450 pounds a piece. Some of them more than that. That's all the weights they, could, we, they probably had inside the, the uh, gym. You know what I'm saying? And the deep back, what we call the eating place, we were just amazed to watch them eat. Some guy sit there and just, wow, how, look at that dude. He had three trays of nothing but spaghetti and butter. Well, and, and, they, and they don't really drink soft drinks or anything like that. They drink water. But little do they know, you know, anybody know, but these, they're Russians. So they make their own liquor. They, they would steal potatoes. You can see every one of them, you grab potatoes when they left the Dagama mess hall. 
They don't eat potatoes. They, they, they brew potatoes. They make vodka. They make their own uh, vodka. And these guys, you know, between alcohol and eating, they can really put away some stuff. But now, we also had, you know, the, El, the Sal, Sal, El Salvador there. Everybody there. They could, they weren't, they could fly their flags. All of them flew their flags. But the United States couldn't fly their flags. I kind of knew that there was something suspicious. Nobody was flying the American flag. I really didn't know it for sure. So I put one on, my, on the end of my crane and, and flew it around for about a month. Until the commander of the base said, hey, pull that thing down. They come up, they come at me with a couple of hum humvees and stuff, and they said the base commander said, pull that thing down. America could not put up his flag in Iraq anytime. Because the Iraqis would have taken it like we were at there to take their country away from them. So they that was a no-no. I ended up taking it off. But I proudly got a lot of pictures. And I got one a video of me flying that flag and that flag, American flags waving in the wind on top of my crane extended. It's really nice. Anyway, I was because I was running cranes, I worked with the dirt crews that did the uh, rock work. Because of the dust, they had to put rock down on all the ground. It doesn't matter whether it was a road. It doesn't matter if it's underneath the, what you call the hooches, the, the trailers that killed, the, they're actually called chews. The chews are the mobile homes without wheels. They're set on blocks. And they're, they come on like flatbed trucks. And we're, we have to unload them with cranes, okay? Um, and they also come in by helicopters sometimes. But they set these chews, they put down rock on the, over the ground first and compact it. And then they put the, the, the rock, and the rock is, you know, three quarter inches, one inch rock, but it's not big. It's river rock. There's no sharp edge river rock in Iraq. But, buddy, there is a lot of rock in Iraq. It come from a quarry where I said. This quarry went down like 100 feet. Kind of like if you watch... Go rush or anything like that. You see them excavating and driving trucks down a road all the way to the bottom. It's all the way, about right at fifteen foot from the bottom. Actually, about thirty foot. There's a, a rock layer. You can see it's a gray rock layer. Almost looks as almost as important as trying to pour a thirty foot slab of concrete without smoothing it off. And they would take that track hose down there and they'd hit it with the teeth. Keep on hitting it, hit, hit it, hit it. And they do that sometimes two, three days. But then sooner or later, that thing would bust open and it'd be like a gumball machine turning loose gumballs or whatever, you know what I'm saying? That, 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 that rock started pouring out of there. Because all that vibration finally shattered those things apart and they're ready to come out and they just poured out loose. And when they come out loose, they were, we're talk, not talking about a little bit, we're talking about a month's worth of rocks come out that they could haul away with, you know, seven yard dump trucks all, uh, uh, you know, several times a day going and get rock. That they need to put it on the roads and put it all under the chews. And, and, and it was, the thing about the rock was, when I got there, I went down to the bottom of this, this pit. The, and down at the bottom of the pit, besides the, seeing the track hole hitting the rocks and stuff, there's a lake, a small lake, when I first got there. And I went down there, and the first thing I could feel was God. I felt God's presence. I took off my shoes. I went to the water's edge. <laughs> I took off my shoes and went to the water's edge. And I said, God. And I, I just said, this is it, isn't it? 
I said, you, I could be standing where you are. You were. Or Adam and Eve was. We was in the Garden of Eden. I noticed the rock. I look at the rock. My brother and I used to collect rocks. We know about rocks. If they didn't have falses in it, they didn't have no signs of that. That means that we're never in, the ocean was never by them. No, nowhere's cl close to them. It wasn't, it was not salt water. We're talking about fresh water rock. And we're not talking about just a lazy old lake or ri river. We're talking about a rushing river that would take those rocks and throw them around. It ran down the middle of Iraq. There was only one river in, in the Garden of Eden, the Pison. And I was standing in the Garden of Eden. I knew I was. And God kind of reaffirmed that. Him and I, he, he kind of let me know. You're on, you're, you're on holy ground, take your shoes off. You know, I'm on sacred ground. Well, in the following year in, in Iraq, I'll, I went to another camp called Spiker. And they were a hub. I lost my driver's license for doing something crazy, you know, trying hill climbing inside one of those pits. You know, I, I got carried away and started driving my truck up and down those hills. <laughs> kind of, I don't know how you, something you would do with a four by uh, a four wheel drive Jeep. <laughs> I was doing with the F uh, 350 truck with my toolbox on back. I only got halfway up the top before I had to back down the first time. Then I backed up further, got a bigger runway, going a little bit faster, and got up three quarters way. Finally, the last time I really punched it and was far enough away, and I was going really fast. When I hit that, that thing, I went not only all the way up, but I flew over the top. <laughs> I flew over the top, and then, you know, it's flat at the top like a plateau. Turned around, they didn't know what was going on. Then I drove it back down, over the edge. If I could make it up, I could make it down. I went down with that same thing, and I did that. The Iraqis and everybody were just cracking up. They, they were on the side, you know, they they, they never seen nobody that crazy in their life. Neither had neither had any of our, my workers, because I didn't go take anybody with me when I did it. And I did it, then I did it about six, seven more times <laughs> before I went and got my crane operator from Turkey. And I got him in there. And uh, another my friend, Jeff, and him and I were in there. And I took him, I took him the back way to the plat top of the plateau. And you know, the fact they were just going to look at something crazy, they didn't know I was going to drive off the edge and go down. Oh my, uh, my, Jeff hadn't been gone, gone, done this either, so he didn't know what I was up to. But poor Armand, he grabbed his heart. He's going to have a heart attack, little old fellow, but he's, a, he's another crane operator. He just sat there, grabbed his heart like he'd have a heart attack. Oh, oh, oh he screamed like a baby. He sounded like screaming like a, a baby when he, you know, before he hit the bottom. He wasn't hurt. I had already done it a half a dozen times, you know, and so. We did it about 12 more times. They got used to it. They say they started doing, you know, I got, got my whole crew and we did it. Well, the next day I kind of lost my driver's license. But they need my crane operator. I, they still need me as a crane operator. So I, they, they can't, you know, they, I, I'm hired to do run cranes. So if I, even if I lost my license, I could drive a crane. So then they started, uh, they came up with the idea of let me be the one that goes, catches all the helicopters and flies to all the other camps. What they do is fly me to camp a week too early, a week or two early, maybe a couple days early, and wait on the convoy to come with my truck, or my crane, on the back of a truck. And then I'd, I'd stay at that camp, and they'd have several things for me to do, you know, just pick up some shoes and move them, or put up some T-walls, or a lot of things we were moving were like, the huge diesel generators. See, some of these diesel generators are up, uh, turn over a crane in a heartbeat. You gotta, you gotta know a little bit about operating to be there because some of the, the stuff is so daggone heavy. Even a concrete bunker, 
that we picked up. I mean, it was so heavy it, it would turn over a crane. Uh, if you don't, if you get it, you try to stretch too far out. You can't stretch. You, you got to keep that thing real close to the crane. Sometimes in, in, inside what they call the outriggers, which is right, right at sometimes right in your face, right at the door. But you got to do that. And sometimes it's just a, a lot of times, most time, me, me, I've learned, you make a straight pick. You just pick it straight up and straight back down. You don't try to swing. You don't try to do anything else. But anyway, that's a crane operator. And I flew to every about every camp that w was in, in no, uh, Iraq, except where I never was at Mosul, where, I guess, I can't even think of the name of those people of Arden. Give us so much trouble from that we're part of the Al-Qaeda. But you know who I'm talking about, that the ones Trump, Trump got rid of. I can't even think of their names right now, but you know. Um, these guys really nothing anyway. They, they, came, they, they were in that war in Syria. But the thing about it is, when, they, when the Iraqis took Mosul and came, they, they came to Mosul, they, they, they just give up. They, didn't, they just let the, the army... So get handed them their weapons. They handed them their tanks. They handed them their their cannons. They handed them all the stuff, and they grew in size overnight by taking because the Iraqis just kind of basically ran ran away. But the Iraqis that were left to fight were not soldiers. The soldiers were killed in uh, Iraq. They were the farmers that had to take their places. People that never fought before. They weren't really well trained. I can tell you something else. Saddam Hussein was not who you think he was. Saddam Hussein, he built Nebuchadnezzar's palace. The ruins of the first, the real Nebuchadnezzar is still right there in Iraq. He built the, his palace adjacent, right next door, right, right, right there so you can see like the before and after picture. It's in my book. Those pictures are in my book. He built it 90% complete, gold and all. He was, it was just, he was, it, they were a rich country. Very rich country. They had a very good education system. In fact, it'll amaze you that at the airport when you go into Baghdad, you know, it's not, it's similar to the United States. They drive on the right hand side of the street. They got the same lane kind of thing, the same kind of excess, the same kind of clover leaves and all that stuff. It's like being in America. It's not, but, and they deserved it. You can do the same thing if you go to Dubai. Dubai irritates me because even the signs, they, they say, okay, you're on the boardwalk or Broadway. You know, you're on First Avenue. You know, they copy it. everything. It's written in, and the thing about in Dubai, it's written in American first, but where it's written in Arabic. You, you, you try to piece of the United States and be, co be copies of the United States. Dubai was like, and still is. That Like they are, are trying to convince them that they are it. They're just like the Americans, just like them. No, they're nowhere, they could never be. These arrogant people, I don't care, they build their, their, their buildings to look like the wind, the water, or the, you know, the earth, you know, this the, the culture, you know, they're proud of that stuff. You go 30 miles out of Dubai and it's nothing but pure desert and you can still see ca the people walking camels on cam camel caravans. It's it's like going and stepping back to the days of of Noah, you know, and Moses, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, the camel people and in, in, in the nomads and things like that, they're all over already. Yet these other guys walk around with these pure white clothes and their black headbands and some of them, you know, checkered hat, uh, things and stuff like that and different things. They, uh, they kind of expect these people that are wearing like brown clothes that, that matched it's the sand, it's kind of like tan, that to lay their garments down so they can walk on it. You know, it's like, they could care less about their own people. They don't have any, they don't even, 
you know, have no respect for anything besides themselves, the rich people. They snob their nose to everybody. And so I write, there's stories in the book about that. But anyway, I was in Iraq and doing this stuff. And I was there, I know I was in the Garden of Eden. I know that I was teaching the Iraqis. I was teaching the Iraqis their own religion. I was telling them about Nebuchadnezzar. I was telling them their own religion. Now, it, when I was at Spiker at the, uh, in Tikrit, Tikrit, the base I was on was actually the, the base, Saddam Hussein's base. It had an Olympic, Olympic sized swimming pool with the third, uh, the 30 foot platform, diving platform, like they have in the Olympics, you know, the cement one, you know, it had that. It had this Olympic stadium with eight lanes on it, you know, all those, all those hurdles and stuff, they were all stacked in the corner. The stadium was huge, probably hold 5,000 people, maybe 8,000. In the middle, like where, where the reporters would be behind glass and stuff, it was Saddam Hussein's picture, but they put Mickey Mouse ears on him and a mustache, and, and, and a Bill and his mustache and stuff, you know? It was like, but Saddam Hussein, he was try, trying to bring, bring back Nebuchadnezzar. Why? He built the, the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. He's building back the palace of Nebuchadnezzar because he was bringing, trying to teach the people back their own history. He's trying to get them to understand, but you know, he still had to let his, tell his people, you don't put your head up. You walk with your head down to the ground. Don't walk. You know why he did that? He did that because those people... The ones sticking their head up and looking around, they were Islamists. They were the ones, the tattletales, the whistleblowers, the ones that would get an army in there with blades trying to cut people's heads off. They're the ones that would blow the whistle and get, hey, hey, I know who they are, I know who they are. You know, so Saddam Hussein told everybody, keep their heads down, keep yourself wrapped up in things, be obedient, don't holler out, because that's what they do. That you want, I wanted, he wants to find the loud mouse. He wanted to find the ones that poked their head up and look around. He wanted to find the ones that were like checking things out. Because that's how you find the Islamics. They can't stay quiet for long. That's the worst thing. That, that's one thing they never learn to keep their mouth shut. When they go in invasion, they ha ah, like Kind of like the Indians do in America, you know, in American stories. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, you can do a lot more if you just say your butt quiet. You know, but they didn't. Learn, they didn't, never learn that they're too proud, and they end up. You know, like I said, with their heads. You know, most of them didn't wake up with the, in the morning with their heads on straight. Okay, in Iraq, but Iraq is still they're calm. The next day, they're just going back to their own life. They're cooking stuff like that outside, and they would pray. Just like the Islamics, they had, they had to face Mecca. They had to, you know, do do everything they do. But the thing about it is, God's inside them. They knew God's inside their hearts, inside them. So it doesn't matter where he was at. It was like, God's there. He knows your heart, so no matter what. They can't tell you how to talk to inside your own mind if you never open up your mind. This, so that's what the Muslims know. They pray five times a day. Three times a day, two times a day. And then they're not being even coached. They're not doing this out of tradition. They've learned where God is at. They've learned to meditate. Holy cow. I mean, so much we don't know and don't even try to find out. But the Muslims, there's 2.3 Muslims in the world today, probably more than that. Now, they might be mixed up with a few Islams in that. But basically, 2.3 billion is almost the same size as the, Catholic, the Christian Catholic Church. You know what I'm saying? It's like almost the same size. There's 1.2, you know, just say 1.5 billion black people in this world. 
Wow, that's got to be another story there, because that's the story of Cain. And if you come, you think of the Aborigine. Cain was almost like an Aborigine. He, the, the ground only bared thistles and thorns. You had to survive. You had to find the water di by digging. I mean, it's like you had, you didn't have nothing to go by. You're not going to, you're not getting any special treatment. You're going to dig. You're going to find, you've got to eat what you can find. You find water from roots, yams. Or even drops of water could could uh, uh, average you could survive off the dew from all water for a whole day. That's it's incredible. When I think of Cain, uh, uh, that uh, 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 Cain, I think of the red uh, the Arabian first, uh, and, and also their looks. They're as cute as can be. Their facial features are really adorable. They got the widened nose. And stuff like that, the features, that's because they, the Aborigines actually live their condition still today. They still live under those harsh conditions. So they're still going to carry those same spatial features because they haven't changed. The other ones adapted, they, they, they started being like everybody else. I'm going to go ahead and tell you about Cain. Cain was the first black man because he, he requested it from God. He requested God. He could have said, I can't bear your punishment. Lest everybody comes to kill me. And becomes after me. And God made him black. He made him black. So everybody, as a sign to everybody, don't help Cain, but don't hurt him. Anybody that touches Cain, is going to be, you have to deal with me. Okay? Cain had that mark as a way of security. It was not a curse. It was a blessing. God gave it to him as a blessing. He changed his features, the wider nose and things like that because of the conditions he's gonna live under. He was, he, he, God was merciful to Cain by giving him a blessing. But you know what I know about God and he's also told me? Kind of like it takes two to tangle. Abel wasn't exactly a, a completely innocent kid. He kind of urged him on, you know, teased him. The thing about the smoke and stuff. I mean, that stuff is like, you throw this kind of stuff up in somebody's face, you might get yourself hurt. There's not a lot of people that can, are civilized like that, you know, can, or, 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 or pet can be pacified like that, or whatever you want to call it, you know what I'm saying? It's just the thing about it is throwing something up in the face. You think one person's innocent, the one who's uh, always guilty. Well, no, nah, sometimes both parties are pretty close, close to even in that situation. I don't know whether they're even in this situation, but uh, it, it didn't happen overnight either. It happened over a period of time. When you finally get fed up, had enough. Either way, whatever happened, you know, God's let me know the story. He's let me know a lot. I've even seen a lot in my, you know, the way that God reveals things to me. Sometimes I actually can see it. Now, I told you I was autistic and I got, I've always been able to do that kind of stuff. I can visualize a story, you know, too. So it might be part of my autism. But the thing about it is, is God... This man was an honorable man. Cain was an honorable man. His son Enoch, whether he was totally black, I don't know, because one of the wives, the, his sisters from Abraham had to fall in love with him, feel sorry for him, and become his wife. And they bore one son, Enoch. One son. Not a bunch of sons, one son. He bore one son, Enoch. And Enoch wrote this thing about the fallen angels. No, nobody can really disprove it. They wanted it, they wanted, would love to see it disproved. And the Catholic Church even hid the story, Enoch's books away. They were coming reading, 
back there in Jesus Christ's time. You know, it's, it's like it, back in the, in, in the Middle Ages too. You know, back then they were just common reading. But finally, the they were canonized. And so they were put in the vaults of the Catholic Church, hidden. Like so many things. Every religion does it. They, they, they only want you to hear what they got to say. And whether they're wrong or right, they, they, they can't admit to it because, I mean, they can't be wishy-washy or they're going to lose their memberships or they're going to lose their power. They can't be questioned. So that's the thing about this world and governments and things. They can't, stand, they can't let the, somebody ask too many questions around them. They can't keep a lot of evidence of something that goes against them. And so they the world is compromised, been compromised from the beginning of time. But getting back to Cain, Cain is, you know, he's a, a terrific guy. He's, he, his wife bore him one son, Enoch. Enoch wrote that book, two books. Um, keep in mind those books were written in the language of Adam and Eve. That's the only language there was. So the only one that could read those books. So anybody, anybody that's ever wrote the translated Enoch's books, <laughs> it's got to be speculation. It's got to be deception. Because the only people that could have read that books had to be, how do you say, kind of like the people you take it for granted when they read hieroglyphics in Egypt, they know what they're talking about. But this is different because that's possible that it, the people in higher lifts know what they're talking about because the people before him said, this is what it means. But there's always nobody before Enoch. There's oh, just Adam. So you couldn't have another language and everybody's language except for Noah was changed. The only person to be able to read Enoch's real writings was Noah and Noah's children, who I already explained were Iraqis. They were Iraqis. And so this book of Enoch speculation and even the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls were more about, a lot of those Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, were written in Arabic. That tells you right there. They were, they were written after the Tower of Babel. Okay? The next thing is, some of those scrolls were written by Thomas. Why was it written by Thomas? And they, 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 those are really threatening to the church. They don't want those out. They had a lot of speculation because Thomas grew up with Jesus Christ. As a child, they grew up together. It's hard for him to, to, to not think Jesus is something special because, you know, hey, he... Him and I played together. We, we, we did everything together. You know what I'm saying? We fished together. You know, we did all kinds of things together. Well, whatever. You know, that's a doubting Thomas. But it, the thing about uh, the, what I'm trying to, I guess these stories I'm trying to tell you is what God's trying to tell me. And I might be, at least I'm trying to stay on point with each subject this time without just going off back and forth twisted. I'm trying to, I just told you about Cain. I told you about Muhammad, you know, I told you about Iraq, and I'm almost, I think I'm, not, I'm, I'm about done talking. I, I, I'm asking God, has he got anything else to add to this one message, other than the fact that yesterday I told you about my book. I didn't get any hits at all on YouTube because I put it under my name, Joseph Jensen, but this video did make it on YouTube. It's on the YouTube under Joseph Jensen. Uh, I was trying to change it, and I might have changed it to Joseph A. A. Jensen Sr. But it is on jo it is on YouTube. In this video, I know how to get it on YouTube because I put it right next to it. And this one will say that. That's why I made it. Now I become. I thought I was going to be a millionaire overnight, or not, not a million. I don't want to be. This isn't about money, because every bit of money I get, I would just turn around and I might pay my bills, and I I have only thirty thousand in debt. It, every everything I have, I own my homes, 
everything. I only have $30,000 in debt. So if I was to pay off my 30,000 debt, everything else, I would buy it and give it books, buy books, buy books, buy books. I, I get the books at $250, uh, every 250 copies at 50% discount. Uh, when I, if I could buy books at 5,000 at a time, 10,000 at a time, geez, I, probably, I can probably get it down to 90, where I'm, I got a 90% discount and they're paying 10%, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm, they've never seen no book published that much. I was telling you yesterday, the, the, the Bible was only published 500,000 Bibles a year. I could do that overnight after this thing starts taking off. Because it's got to reach the whole world, but not just by me. The reason why, okay, I got it figured out. I had a plan figured out, and I got to tell you about it. I'm going to start going to bookstores. As soon as I'm going to get the, get the completion thing on the second floor, and I can get the certificate of occupancy of this house, I can finally get a first mortgage. I've been able to get a first mortgage for ever for 35 years on this house because they considered it brand new <laughs> oh my god so anyway anyway when you ever you tear our house apart so much they say it's unlivable right you know and say that was 35 years ago and they get that back now they it's got to be brand new basically meet all the codes brand new that's a brand new home nothing's grandfathered in so that's where I'm at right now. Hopefully by the end of the month, I will have that, those papers and I will get my first mortgage. And when I get my first mortgage, I will pay all my debt and still be able to buy some books. When I get those books, 250 books of a piece, I'm gonna be go to start going to local bookstores. If in the town I live in, Florence, South Carolina, or it's close to me, it's got four major bookstores, Barnes & Noble, the Bible Bookstore, and two others. I'll go there with my books. I'll sell my 50 of those 250 piece, 100 books, 50 of one and 50 of the other. I'll give them to them at cost. I don't want no money back. The bookstore has that and they can make 50 cents for profit on those books. The other books, of course, they're all first edition. I told you the first editions will never, never, they're, they're collector's items. They're for the people that, collectors. So I will expect the full price for those books. In fact, I'll ask the people to add the penny, let me ha have the penny for the one book and the dollar and the penny for the, for the other book so I don't have to pr process change. You know, give me thirty dollars for one book, forty and another, seventy for both of them. I'll sign the books. I'll and add any literature or bookmarkers, or anything to that. As some, you know, kind of, and I would. I want the people to read the book, but I also want the collectors to understand to take care of the condition of the book because it might be worth something. Because if those fifty thousand books, and I end up. Overall, I'm not stopping till I reach the whole world. And the rest of my life, if I spent the whole rest of my life, there's 77, okay, there's 52 states in the United States. If I'm going to one city in South Carolina, and there's only five major cities in South Carolina. If you only go to five major cities in South Carolina, Charleston, Columbia, Greenville, Spartanburg, might be more. But anyway, you see, I know so many books are going to sell like that. You think, where I go to book signings, I'll try to sell 25 books, just 25 books in each store. That's 100 books a piece. That gives, leaves me 100 out of the two, original 250. To try to sell 100 books a piece, that is enough money to recover and get, re, get a, order another thing. So there's still, I still basically got 103 books or I can make 100% uh, uh, profit. 
by, by reselling those books. But I'm not out to make the money. I've already I got my mortgage. So it's a low mortgage because it was only thirty thousand dollars anyway. You know, it might be sixty-five because I I would like some extra money uh, to do some a few more things like get my trees cut out of here. Like the trees, my trees are going to cost me like fourteen thousand dollars to get out of here. They're huge. There's about 10, 10 oak trees, huge oak trees that are getting close to seventy-five foot tall. They're dangerous. They need to go. They're pretty, but you, can, you can't afford that. And the yard needs to be, be leveled off afterwards, taking, you know, everything. So I guess when I'm getting to the point that I'm saying, I had the rest of my life, if I spent the rest of my days of my life, I, I can't even live 50, you know, there's only 52 weeks in a month. And I, 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 if I spent 52 weeks, uh, uh, you know, every week in a different city and going to each city in South Carolina, you know, you're talking about four or five cities. You know, it's like it would take me the rest of my life just to come to the United States, but I can't afford to do that. I have to have people doing what I'm doing. But I'm not going to sign the second set of books, the revised set of books, the books that I, I give to people for four dollars, it's three dollars, or seven dollars a month. They're going to get the other revision, which won't have any mistakes in it. But neither will it have my signature. In it. it might have my stamp signature, but it's not going to have my signature in it. Okay? Why? Because I can't be there in person to everybody. As soon as I get other people selling my book in the bookstores. And do it, you know, the same way. Get my books to, to sell 250 books in every to every state a piece. 500 books in every state in a month. You know, get the salesman to do that job in there. I, the first thing I'm going to do is write my book and get my book printed with the proceeds. Not only get books print, printed but I, to, to give away, but I've got to ha have them written in Arabic to the Muslims. The Muslims will be, all the Muslims, including the Iraqis, because they, let me tell you something about the, again, about the Iraqis. The Iraqis learned to speak everybody's language. They know more than one language. They spoke Greek at one time. That's when Alexander the Great was there. They spoke Turkish. They spoke Iranian. You know, and they speak Arabic. God had them learning Told them, you know, you just fall in there, do what they do, and speak their language because you, you know what you got underneath your feet. That's written in Michael Chu's book. Okay? So they're not dumb people. And what I'm saying is they, 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 got, they got a lot of things, that hidden things that this world, if they went to there, they would try to either exploit those stuff Exploit it, or they would cover it up and destroy it. They can't afford to get out. Nothing that, that, that I learned about the Iraqis can be uncovered, given to the world. The, the world will exploit it, or they'll try to get rid of it. Okay, that's the way the world is. Because the world is only interested in power. The same with the Ethiopians. The same, you know... I can tell you about the Ark of the Covenant, but I'm not encouraging anybody to go after it. I'm not encouraging anybody to, take, to try, try to go to bounce down the walls of the Holy of Holies. Accept it. It doesn't matter anyway. You know why? Each and every one of you people's walk is individual with God. Every time you get together with a group and stuff like that, is that a God or is that a you? Ask yourself. Did God put you in that situation, meeting somebody, strangers that have something in commonality to, to create something special? Or is this something you put together? You know, people want to become their own God, be their own God. They want to make other, other people and other things, football and anything else, their gods. Now, I'm not got nothing against football because God doesn't have anything against football. Because if you be an athlete, you didn't do that by yourself. That was God. And your ancestors and your parents cheering you on. Giving you, they're the ones that rolled you out of bed to, to go to the gym. They're the ones that rolled you out of bed and, and, 
and you know, they, they are as much invested in you, more invested in you than any, than any coach or anybody else has invested in you. They've invested everything in teaching you whatever talents you had to build something, create something. So don't, don't take down any sport like they're, 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 they're gods. They're not, they're gods. It's what everybody's path is headed on a journey. You end up being a professor, a doctor, a lawyer, anything you become. You didn't get there because on your own. You didn't go through school without them coaching you, teaching you. So getting back to my books, I'm going to write it in Iraq so I can get to all the Muslims. While I'm in, in the back in uh, 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 in all the I'm not looking for them going back to Dubai. Well, I am with my book and what I got to say because it's a cute thing what I wrote in, in my book about Dubai. <laughs> you got to read the book. You'll enjoy that, a lot of what I say about, you know, about Dubai and stuff. But you see, the thing about it is, is my character, Michael, too, is me. I created Michael, too. And if I could do what Michael does, I would do exactly what Michael does. Believe me, everything that Michael does and says in that book, I would be doing that if I had the resources before I died. Do you know what Michael too was? He was the richest guy in the world, in the country, but he lived off 1%, less than 1% of what he brought in. He was, a, he was the richest guy in the world a thousand times over. Read the book. But he lived on less than 1%. He didn't have anything special. And he didn't consider, you know, Michael too considered himself special. Yeah, he, he considered himself. I'm not considering myself special. That's the difference between me and Michael too. I'm saying you're special. You're special. You're just as special as, as anybody in this world. I'm not going to go about to say me. No, don't say that, me. I, I mean, get off of me. I don't want anybody P put me on no pedestal. I won't have a church. I don't want to be like any other body thinking. I don't want to anybody looking at me like I'm a, anything different. You all have stories to tell. You all got a, a journeys to go. You all can create anything in this world. I don't care. You might be the next person building something equivalent to the uh, the pyramid. And it, 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 and if you do, if these women, especially don't, and, and men, don't do anything more than have children and treat your children right, you've done more than you could ever build. You can build things, but you, you can't raise children. You can't think. And for the women that do have to have abortions, by God, have all your eggs harvested before you ever have it. Give somebody else a chance to, ha to have those, those children. Like in China, I've heard horror stories in countries where they eat the eggs of women, like caviar. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. That's sick. That's no, no consideration for any, them, the human being that they get killed, or any life. That's so disrespectful. Because if they can feed you that stuff in a restaurant as roe, caviar. She's God. I'm, I'm so sorry. Like I said, I can't say, I, I can't focus on Christianity even though I'm a Pentecostal Christian. But my ministry is about God. Because this is, if you're going to be led to Christ, Christianity, you got to be led to Christianity. You got to want to become a Christian. You got to learn. 
And when you learn about it, you might be really confused over that religion because the way the people act. Too many of them are arrogant, smug people. They put themselves way ahead, of, like they're, they're, they're so special. They're making, they, they, they judge you, they prejudge you. They don't, they don't really care about you other than the fact that they just want your money or, or their, your attention or your attendance. If you're, if you're not giving to those churches, if you're not abiding those churches, they're just kind of like, they don't care whether you go, go to their church or not. You don't fit their mold. I'm not discouraging anybody to come, go to walk away from the churches. I'm encouraging everybody that believes in God and knows God's inside them to go to those churches and start looking for the people that can't can't afford to eat. Take them to Ruby Teaches if you can afford to feed them. Invite them. Like the, the preacher, you know he's going to go. He's going to go, you know, it says old saying, preachers love chicken. Well, lately I've seen teachers eating prime rib and steak and gourmet food. But, you know, even if they love chicken, that's more than a lot of people have. So it's the people of God that should go to the church and kind of pick up the person that's down and out and invite them to come to their house for supper. You know, a home-cooked meal. Let's sit down and tell each other stories. What did you do? What did God have you you doing this week? And what did I, what you, uh, thing. Don't talk about stuff you don't know about. Quit speculating. Speculate. Everybody needs to quit speculating. It's a clear, it's a clear story now. The whole story is cleared up. There's no speculation. That's why we're not going to get into Christianity. Because there is too much speculation. There's no speculation with God. It's a simple thing. God's either he's up there in the sky and you're calling to him out there in the sky or he's where I say it is. I don't debate anybody to give me a better answer. I'm willing to listen. I'm encouraging everybody to get to, to stay on their laptops, stay on their computers, read the books, go to archives. I haven't been able to get into, but I would love to go to to to, to all the big life. Uh, in fact, I told you I'm all, I'm going blind. It's too almost too late for me to go to the archives in Washington and look in, look in the Library of Congress for answers. So it's almost too late for me, you know. I've re I've been around and listening to things a long time, and even I even on the internet, not the internet, but on TV, I heard documentaries from the Jews themselves talk about the the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees. Oh my God, it's not even hidden with them, and it's just in their library. But those scribes and Pharisees, they were marrying kids as, as young as two years old. And messing with them at, at that age. You know, they were, per they were total perverts. And it's in their own writings. They don't hide it. It's just in their own libraries. That's why this documentary just pointed it out. It was some guy like Zola, which I really respected. He was a, a Christian Jew that brought the stories out, you know, and he he was telling me like this was a perverted bunch, and that and that wrote that stuff that was a, a, a certain sect in the Jewish religion that would have the younger the wife, the the more the power they had. I, they, what they were doing was. How could, how they could say they're 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 more special than the uh, Islam? <laughs> but you know one thing, even the Islamic, the worst Islamic leader. I was saying yesterday, the Hell's Angel. If I could t talk to a Hell's Angel, and he put he put a after I got through with him, he's he wore a patch with his colors that said, "God's in me." That would make my day. The same as if an Islamic. Finally, he sees the light. And he, he, he does the same thing. He says, God's living in me. Not God's. 
but one God, Allah, who's the me? That's got to make your day. And he needs to not call himself Islamic. He needs to call himself a Muslim if he does believe that. Maybe we would know who's who's who if they would finally be able to separate the Muslims from the Islams. The Islams are still in Medina. Medina, if you want to look it up, all the terrorists come out of Medina. The worst people in the world come out of Medina. Medina had to commit genocide and keep, keep that thing. They could never go back to Mecca. How can they go back to Mecca with their, with their, their, their Quran? Because the fact is, the Qurans know that they never came there with 10,000 soldiers to Mecca. It was us opposite. They get to Medina with 10,000 soldiers. Muhammad, in a day in his life, never, what, never had an army. They know that. Meccans will tell you that. So the, the, the true the Islamists go back there and say, well, he was a big man and he was a soldier and he had a... Muhammad never even preached. He never could... He didn't do anything to harm another person. He would never had an army. That's why God cried. Anyway, I've got to go. God, I've said a lot in this, this program. I might have said too much. I don't know. I never could say too much because this is God's deal. Okay, you know, that's, it's not me. That's second guessing and I don't like to do that. I, I, I forgive you, God. But anyway, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's all about God. It's not about me. I love you guys. This is my second video. It's what I'm going to use when I go to bookstores. All I got to do is put up my YouTube channel, channels. They can see it on their, uh, at the, on their own time. They buy my books. My books are collector's items. The ones I sell at the bookstores and stuff are collector's items. I'm not going to hand out a, a, a original book with the mistakes in it to anybody except for a paying customer that actually uh, I had to, you know, from the beginning, okay? If anybody else is going to get the revised edition, they won't be signed, but there's a, they're, they're actually better because there's no mistakes in it, okay? The rest of my life, I've got to write it in, in, in Arabic. After Arabic, I'm going to write it in Korean. Because I want to go to Korea because it's, it's written in the book. I want to go to Ethiopia. You see what I'm saying? I'm going to put them in all these languages. 77 different languages. My books are written in 77 different languages. And it can be spread after I, these three countries that I want to go to. You know, all the Muslim nations, these three these three languages I go, one Ethiopian and Korean. After they got that, anybody can take my place and do the same thing. Because I'll be dead. I mean, no, it's going to take me the rest of my life to get three countries. But that's three out of 77 right there that my book's got to be printed in. And whoever, not whoever, takes my place, but the people that take my place and publish it in all the rest of the languages, they will be from those countries. They will get it written in that, their language and published in those, 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 those countries, not in the United States. They'll get them published and they'll take my book and, and, and get it published in their, in their language and their understanding from the beginning because you can't take American money and take it to another country. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You got to leave. Their culture might live on a dollar a day. You can't get just and it, 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 you know it's just you can't do that. Now you're getting in political things and you're making something political. So you have to give the book to be published by them. We want to go to Arabic. It's got to be published by the Air, uh, uh, somebody uh, Iraqis or somebody. You know what I'm saying? Using their currency. Go to Korean. Korea, you have to do the same thing. By their culture. Because the word's got to get out to them and they got to be able to afford the book. 
Okay, so that anyway, I, I, I said what I'm gonna say. Everything I, I, you know, I can think of. God's not telling me to say anymore except for goodbye. And I love you. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna push the button on the camera and go. God bless you all. And <laughs> good night. <laughs>